Father, we come. And Lord, we just sang, Lord, we thank you to your son, Jesus, for he has truly set us apart. He has set us apart from sin and shame, the bondage that comes with it, Lord, that we can follow you. And Lord, we're so grateful this morning for that. Truly, may our worship this morning echo our thanksgiving unto you, Father. And Lord, as we meet in this place this morning, help us just to set our hearts on you. That Lord, as we sing, as we fellowship, Lord, as we open up the scriptures now, help our hearts and minds be so focused on you. Lord, that we just humble ourselves and Lord, pray that Lord, you speak to us in a great and mighty way this morning. God, we're thankful that we're here. And God, my, my heart's prayer is that you would use me to teach your word in such a powerful and in such a helpful way that would bring honor and glory to you and that would help the people of our church. God, we love you this morning and we're thankful that we get to worship together. We love you in the precious, beautiful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and all God's children said it together. Amen. All right, thank you. You guys may be seated. Hey, good morning. What's up, guys? Morning. All right. Doing all right? Yeah. All right. Some of us are. Okay. Well, let me help you out here a little bit. Uh, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Hebrews. We'll be in the book of Hebrews chapter number six this morning. Hebrews chapter number six. If you're joining us for the first time, we are have been going through the book of Hebrews now for the last couple of uh, weeks now. I think this is week number uh, six. Yeah, week number six in the book of Hebrews. And so uh, we've kind of just taken it journey or step by step, just chapter by chapter, just looking at the overarching message of the book of Hebrews. All righty. Hebrews chapter 6. So we will begin our time this morning uh, tackling a controversial subject. One of the great ways I like to begin teaching God's Word is start by something controversial. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and if you grew up in church or if you have been, have any length of study in the Word of God, maybe you come across this passage and uh, we'll, we're going to just tackle it head on this morning. So we'll be in verse number 4. Verse number four, to start our time together. It says this, For it is impossible, in the case of those who have been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance, since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. Now, we're not going to just break apart this verse, but basically, if you look at verses 4 through 6 and throughout chapter 4, um, it's often used to convey that a Christian can lose their salvation. It's used to convey this idea that, hey, once you come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior— one can come to the point that they can come to re then reject Jesus Christ. But if you've been at this church for any amount of time, you know that I adamantly believe, and we've guided our church as such, that the Christian, once they come to know Christ, they are hold, held fast in the arms of God. They are loved by God unconditionally, and thus and therefore, once they become a child of God, they can then never, ever lose that privilege of being a son and daughter of the king. So then when you come to verses like this where it talks about, hey, you have once come to know Christ, but then you start to fall away, there has to be an explanation for that. And I'll give you two. Number one, one explanation could possibly be that once you come to Christ, then think about what he's saying here when you think about the passage. You can come to Christ, and you can leave or forsake or, or reject Christ, but then it says, well, then you can never, ever come back. So let me get this straight. So once you come to Christ, you reject Christ in a sense, but then even if you then repent of that, you can never, ever come back. I mean, that's crazy to think about, that one cannot repent of their sin and then come back to Jesus. Well, I think that what the author of Hebrews is conveying is a rhetorical situation. A rhetorical situation painted that of, you can't leave Christ in the first place. You can't come back because you never left the fold. 
And thus, he conveys this message here in Hebrews 4, excuse me, 6, verses 4 through 6. That's one possible explanation. The second explanation is probably more my favorite one. When it talks about falling from grace, it talks about those who have once enlightened themselves, what is it possibly talking to? Well, let me illustrate. Um, so suppose I have a daughter named Grace, okay? Suppose I had a daughter named Grace, and if she looks like her mother, she's a knockout, all right? She's a knockout. Amanda isn't here right now, but you can tell her I said that, all right? Do me a favor here. And um, suppose I have a daughter named Grace, and she grows up to be a, a, a gorgeous young lady. And suppose we live in a two-story house, and... There's a boy who is coming after my daughter. Let's just say his name is Noah, right here. His name is Noah, and a young teenage boy, and he comes infatuated with my daughter named Grace. And so he begins to pursue my daughter, and then one of the ideas he gets in his brain is, hey, there's a ladder in Pastor Mike's backyard. Let me get his ladder put, prop it up to Grace's window on the second floor, and let me let me sneak into her bedroom. And suppose he does that, and I'm in the room next door, and I hear Noah, I hear something in my daughter's bedroom, so I begin to check out what it is. Noah makes it to the top right when I walk in. And I go into my daughter's bedroom, her name is Grace again, and I see Noah, what am I going to do? I'm going to go to the window, I'm going to say, hi, Noah, and then I'm going to then proceed to push the ladder down. Now, what is Noah doing? Noah is falling from grace. Now, did Noah ever have grace? By no means. Oh, he was close. He was close. But he never had grace. Perhaps this is referring to people who may be sitting in our church right now they, 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 they know the idea of Jesus. They may even like the music that we sing. They may even like the messages that pastor preaches. They like this concept of Jesus and Christianity. They know it here, but they don't quite yet know it here. See, that they like the idea of Jesus, but this idea of surrender, the, this idea of, of submitting and surrendering to Jesus... That's not down with them. You see, they know things about Christians, but they are then themselves not a Christian. And so when it talks about falling from grace, it's those who were so close, but yet never made that final decision to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior of their lives. You know why I believe those two plausible explanations for Hebrews chapter 4 verses uh, Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 6. Because I believe that, that salvation is a promise from God. That your salvation is not dependent upon you. Like, like your salvation is not this struggle, right? It's not the struggle of, hey, there's God just offering salvation, and, and then you just, have, it's, just it's, not, it's not the struggle, rather. Salvation is a promise and a gift from God for you and I to simply to accept. Let me, let, me, let me share with you what I mean. In the Gospel of John, perhaps one of the most important or perhaps famous verses that you memorized growing up, or you, if you watch football, you've seen a sign in the stands, John 3.16, right? In John 3.16, it says this, For God so loved the world. And that includes you, by the way. You are a part of the world. For God so loved the world, it says this, that he gave his only son, Jesus, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. What does that mean? It means whoever believes will have eternal life. And it's not, there's no condition on it. There's no, hey, if you meet the expert. No, no, no. It says whoever simply believes will have eternal life. Now, I know the word promise isn't in this verse, but this is a Bible promise that you and I as Christians, if you are in Christ, if you have come to know Christ, that we can forever cling on to. Question, is your life rooted 
in the promises of God. If not, I want to encourage you this morning. I want to help you. I want to bless you. Because you are living with one of, one of, of, one of, one of two things guiding you. Number one, you're living off of feelings or what everyone else thinks and says. Or you can live your life based upon the promises of God. Two points this morning. That's it. Just two points. And I'm going to give to you right now. Point number one, the promises of God, which leads us into point number two, is rooted in the character of God. Let's look at verse 13 of Hebrews chapter 6. I love this passage. Verse 13, it says this. For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. Now, to understand this passage, what the author of Hebrews is saying here, it takes us all the way back to a promise God makes to Abraham, all the way that it takes all the way back in Genesis chapter 15, if you didn't have it, it's a taking note. Genesis chapter 15 is a counter reference to this passage. But the promise that Abraham it receives from God is this Abraham, you are a nobody. Abraham, you are a nothing. But yet, though you are nothing, though you are so insignificant, I will make this promise to you, Abraham. And Abraham, if you read Genesis, he, he is very adamant about that. He says, that Genesis, he says to Abraham, hey, you are the least of all peoples. But yet I will make this promise to you, Abraham. You, will be, you and your descendants will be a great nation. I will multiply you. Numbers will be the sands of the sea. And you will be a great people. And that was a promise that God made to Abraham. Problem, though, he had no kids. He had no kids. And yet God makes him this promise. Hey, your offspring, hey, they're going to be this great nation one day. I know you don't have kids, but hey, this is the promise that I'm making to you. But when I read this passage I was studying this week, I was a little perplexed by verse number 16. Look at it again with me. Verse 15, excuse me. It says, and thus Abraham, after receiving this promise, it says, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. So let me be straight with you. As I was studying this passage, I struggled a little bit. Because if you grew up in church, you know, you grew up reading these Old Testament stories. And when you think of the life of Abraham... What comes to mind as you read the book of Genesis is not a patient man, right? When I read the book of Genesis, I read about a guy who was not a clean-cut dude who you and I would think, hey, no wonder God used him. No, no, no. Because when I was reading this, I was thinking, God, why in the world would you use Abraham? Why in the world would you make this promise to Abraham? This guy didn't wait patiently. He is not someone who I would say deserves the promises of God. And yet, I was perplexed by that. Why would the, the, the author of Hebrews not read the book of Genesis? Was he illiterate? That's what I was thinking. Two examples come to mind. So Abraham is married to a woman named Sarah, right? And so, and, and, and Sarah, from what we understand, is a good-looking woman. I mean, she's fine. And, and so Abraham is, long story short, I'll give you the 2020 version. Um, so they're walking, they're strolling through town and just going out and about, minding their own business. And then an, another dude who is like the, uh, pa the king of the city catches, Sarah catches his attention. I says, man, she's good looking. So, so he, he sends his guards, his servants, his escort crew, and he, he sends them and says, hey, bring Sarah here. I want to get to know her. But before he does that, they ask Abraham, hey, who, who is that? you know what he says? He says, of his wife, he says, oh, oh, 
um, that, that woman there, uh, she, she, she's my sister. Whoa, 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 whoa. I mean, ladies, if your husband ever, ever refers to you as his sister, you have my permission to smack him upside the head, and I will forgive you, right? I will do that blessing thing. I don't care what I, you smack your husband across the head. I mean, and, and Abraham even said, Genesis chapter 20, if you don't believe me, Genesis chapter 20. And you know why he said that? Because the king brings him up and says, hey, why did you lie to me? He says, I, were, I was scared that you were going to beat me up and kill me over my, my, my wife. So I called her my sister. I mean, how lame was that? But just five chapters ago, did not God say to Abraham, you and your descendants, you and your wife Sarah are going to give birth to a great nation? And yet five chapters later, he's telling people, uh, that's not my wife, that's my sister. Loser. I mean, come on, man. Here's, here's another one. Here's another one. So down the road, right, they're, they're older in age, but yet yeah, God made that promise to them. And so Sarah gets this idea. I have no idea why you would think of this. But Sarah goes, hey, I have my, I have my maidservant. Her name is Hagar. Hey, I can't give you a child, so have a kid with my servant lady. I, I can't make this stuff up. It's in the Bible. And says, hey, go, go hang out with my servant woman. Have a kid with her. And yeah, do it like that. And you know what the knucklehead says? Sure, I'll do that. And they have a... Do you see why I read chapter f verse 15 and I'm like, dude, that, that, that guy did not wait patiently on the promises of God. So I'm perplexed thinking to myself, what in the world is the author talking about? But then I begin to think to myself, when I consider the entirety of the message of the gospel, I think the author of Hebrews is right, and I am wrong. Because the author of Hebrews is taking into effect or taking into mind the whole entire character of God. Because you realize God does not define you by your failures. Oh, what was Abraham a failure? Oh, yeah. I mean, time and time again, Abraham blows it. But yet, thousands of years later, it is spoken of Abraham that he was a great man of faith, that he, he waited diligently and patiently for the Lord. Could it be that God does not define us by our failures, but rather... He defines us by his promises. God does not define us by our failures. And let's be honest, for us, hallelujah. Because our failures are plenty and they are many, are they not? But yet he defines us by the promises that he has made and spoken over us. Wow. And it has to be this way. Because yeah, despite all our failures, isn't it amazing that God still considers us his sons and daughters? Isn't it amazing that we fall way short of God's glory, that you and I are still called, that we are still called joint heirs with Jesus Christ? That one day, that, that we will inherit the promises of everything that Jesus has. That is only possible because we have the promises of God. Because if that were, if it were any other way, if it were up to your goodness, if it were up to me living up to a standard, hey, all of us would fall way short. And thus, we would have to hold on to what we think about ourselves. We are to hold on to the promises of God. Like, I, I want you to think about this next question. And I want you to raise your hand if this applies to you. I want you to raise your hand, and I want to encourage you. Now, if you are a Christian this morning, I, want to, I, want just, I just want you to participate with me. I want you to raise your hand if, if you can say to yourself right now, 
that I thought, I thought that I was going to be further along in my walk with Jesus than, were, than where I am right now. Raise your hand, would you? I thought I was going to be further. Hey, if you're a Christian, you just look around the room. I mean, like, there are a lot of hands up right now. I want to encourage you with that. Because may, maybe what comes to mind is, hey, pastor, you know, I made this decision one year ago. I remember, hey, you preached that message, or I heard this online, or I heard it somewhere. Hey, you know, I, I just made the decision. I'm going to begin to control my anger. And just maybe on the way to church this morning, you blew up at your spouse, you blew up your kids. Get in the car, guys! Right? Maybe, maybe, maybe you made the decision, you know what? Come 2020, man, we are just going to be faithful to church. We're going to be faithful to serve. We're going to be faithful to give. And man, like, what, like eight weeks into 2020, like, man, we blew it. Maybe you thought maybe I would be a further along than I am right now. Praise God that we do not live on feelings, but that we live on the promises of God. Because if it were up to you or me, now we'd have blown it a long time ago. In fact, one of my favorite quotes is this. If you could lose your salvation, you would, you would have done so. But God is holding on to us because of his promises. And you and I can take that to the bank. Hey, let me show you some passages that, hey, you can just cling on to his promises from God. Because I don't know what you're going through. Because maybe right now you feel far from the Lord right now. Or maybe you like say, hey, Pastor, I got this going on. I just don't see where God is just with me. I don't see where God is. One of my favorite passages. And I almost call it the cliche verse. But man, it's powerful. I'm going to show it to you guys. Romans 8, 28. It says this. And we know that for those who love God, and that phrase love God, all it simply means is for those who have come to know Christ. It says this. For, and we know that all who come to love God all things. We, we studied that word last week, did we not? All. And just to refresh our memories, what does the word all mean, church? All. Like everything, right? Yeah, great. You guys are awesome. Man, you guys pay attention last week. Got it. All things work together for good for those who are called according to his purposes. His purpose. Say, so, Pastor, you know what? I, 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 man, I just don't know if I'm a Christian right now. You know, I got, I got so much garbage and, just, and just, just, just things. Like, man, does God even, does God even love me? Like, would he allow that to happen to me? It says here, all things work together. Two things are always happening simultaneously in the life of a Christian. Number one, everything that happens to you happens for God's glory. And number two, God's good. Those things are always simultaneously happening in the life of a believer. So you look at your situation and you think, man, has God forsaken me? No, 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 no. God is working all things out for, your glory, for his glory, your good. Whatever you're going through, God has not abandoned you. God is working in you. And, and, and maybe the junk that you're going through Perhaps what he's trying to do is bring you to your knees to remind you how much you do, in fact, need him. Maybe he's breaking you right now so that you will humble yourself and that you will come to a point where you realize, man, I don't got it all together. I don't. So therefore, I need Jesus because I cannot hold the weight and the burden of life on my own. Maybe that's what he's trying to do to you. Here's another verse. It's on the first Corinthians. It says this Who will sustain you to the end? Guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. It says, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Two words here. Who will sustain you to the end? Word, guiltless. Are you and I guiltless? No. We're sinners. But yet, 
Why are we considered guiltless? Again, we are not defined by our failures. We are defined by the promises of God. And what has God promised over the believer? Hey, your sins are no more. Hey, they're gone. Hey, you're forgiven. And thus, you're blameless. Hey, who will sustain you to the end? Jesus. The promises of God have been just already spoken over you. Hey, claim them, believer. So next time, hey, you begin to feel just sorrow over your sin. Hey, yes, feel sorry and sorrow over your sin. But may your sin not bring you down. But may it bring you up to the Father. Do you realize that every time you sin, yes, there should be remorse, and yes, there should be repentance in the believer. Absolutely. But that repentance does not drive them away from God. You see, you know why some, I believe some Christians run from God when they sin? Again, I've been doing this for 10 years, guys. I, over 10 years, I've learned a thing or two. I've seen a thing or two. But one common thing I see amongst many people who claim the name of Jesus is they fall into sin and rather running to Jesus, they run from. Why? Because I believe they are not clinging to the promises of God. They begin to fall into this lie, well, God then can't love me. God can't use me. God can't bless me. But what has God promised? I will sustain you to the end. And I will hold you guiltless at the day of Jesus Christ. When Jesus comes back, I will hold you guiltless. Your sin will not define you. Your failures will not define you. But what God has spoken over you will be true. The promises of God are rooted in the character of God. Look with me now at verse 16. Why can you and I cling to these promises? Verse 16. He says, For people swear by something greater than themselves. Right? Maybe you I swear in my mother's grave, as you've heard it before. Probably shouldn't do that, but uh, that's been thrown out there. And in all their disputes, an oath is final for confirmation. Maybe you and I, we sign contracts, we make commitments. Verse 17. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise, the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. So that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie. We who have fled from refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. You see, as the promises of God to Abraham were sealed by God's promises, our salvation today is cemented by, yes, the promises of God, but also the character of God. And the character of God is one in which he cannot lie. Jesus is the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews 13.8 says that. We'll have it on the screens here. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You know why you and I can cling to the promises of God? Because I made promises to my kids. In fact, I made a promise to my daughter that, that I forget what it was. I think she, I said she can have a piece of candy or something like that, or I would take her somewhere. And then my kids, they hold me to their promises, all right? I mean, they tell me they're going to clean their room. I, hold, I can't hold them to that, okay? It's not fair. Being a parent is not fair sometimes. But, but whenever I make a promise to my children, oh, man, if I don't keep that promise, oh, man, they let me know. 
Dad, you, I mean, something will happen, right? Hey, we're going to go to the park, kids. We're going to go to Fun Factory. We're going to go Chuck E. Cheese's. Oh, and then something happens where like, an emergency happens, and they'll say, Dad, you, you, you promised us. Hey, things change, right, parents? Plans change. Because I didn't see what was going to happen that day. I didn't see what was going to happen later on. But you do, you do know who's, who knows what's going to happen later on? God. Because he knows, hey, what's going to happen? He knows what happened yesterday. He knows what's going to happen today. And thus, he knows what's going to happen tomorrow. And then in, in light of eternity, he knows what's going to happen. And thus, he says, hey, I'm the same today, yesterday, forever. I am not affected by circumstances. I am not affected by what happens tomorrow. Hey, nothing catches me off guard. And thus, I can hold fast to the promise of God because he knows what's in store. He knows my past. He knows everything. He knows everything. And thus, we can hold him to his promises. And let me just love you for a moment here. I'm going to say something that is totally countercultural, but I think will bless you tremendously. I mean, like this, is, this would rub people the wrong way, but man, if you receive this in the right heart, I'm trying to give it, man, it will help you and bless you tremendously. And here it is. You are not that special. I know we live in like participation trophy type society today. I know like we want to feel good about ourselves, but can I just love you and tell you, you're not that great. You're not that special. You are not the exception to the rule. You are just not. And so why is that so encouraging, Pastor? Because you thought you were special? Because God's promises apply to you too. Right? I, I meet people, I, I share with them these things, and yeah, Pastor, like, I, I know these things, but yeah, that's great for other Christians, but then, then there's me. Like, sometimes I don't say what I think, but inside I'm thinking, wait a minute, you mean out of the billions and billions of people in this world, there's everyone else and there's you? Right? I mean, Really? Well, like, the promises of like, God knowing the past, knowing the present, and then knowing the future, having wrote the scriptures, having made these promises, spoken them over believers from eternity on, and then there's you. But Pastor, you don't know what I've done. You don't know, like, the, the set of stuff I've, I'm into, this, my struggles. And it's almost like, like there's, a, there's, like, the promises of God, and then there's you. You are not that special. You are not that awesome that that you would then disqualify yourself from these promises. You're just not that great. But praise God, you're not. Because you then fall under the promises along with the children of God. That God promises his, his love over you. Oh, yes, you can run, believer. Do I believe that Christian can run? Oh, yeah. But you know what then comes right after him? The chastening hand of God comes after them. Whom the Lord loving, loves. The Bible says he chastens or he, he goes after them. God loves you, Christian, and he pursues you. And here's, a, here's an awesome verse. It's found in 2 Timothy 2.13. I want you to maybe cling this verse on today. It says, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. Why? For he cannot deny himself. I love this verse. You know why? Because even when I am unfaithful, and if I were to poll you, no one in here would say, Pastor, I am faithful to to my promises to God. Like, I'm like, I am the Christian that I should be 24-7, no doubt. No one would say that. But all of us would agree, Pastor, I am unfaithful to the Lord. I have my good days and I have my bad days. I have my days where I feel like, man, I'm a saint. Then I have other days where I just feel like a sinner. And even when we are unfaithful, 
God is faithful to, to stand and to keep his promises. I, I love this idea. You know what salvation is not you holding on to God? Like your salvation is not me just clinging fast to Jesus. It, it's not me just holding on for your dear life because, man, if I mess this up, I'm going to somehow do, I'm going to somehow be cast into hell. I'm going to be your salvation is not you holding on, clinging on to Jesus. Your salvation is Jesus holding on to you. It is Jesus staying fast, holding fast, staying true to his promises. And what is a promise to the Christian? Eternal life. So, Pastor, how does this apply to me today? I'm so glad you asked. Let's look at verse 19 and 20. Because I know you've been wondering this for the whole time. Verse 19. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor. And that word anchor there, it is a symbol for safety, security, and hope. Verse 19. And we have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. A hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain. I know that's weird verbiage there, but all that simply means is here an anchor is giving the analogy or the parallel of when the high priest in the Old Testament would go into the holies of holies, which was a symbol for the presence of God. And I'll make sense of all that here in a few moments. Verse 20. Where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek is an Old Testament priest dating all the way back to Genesis. It was a line of priesthood, which, which Jesus is the great high priest. So, Pastor, how do we make sense of all this? That you and I have an anchor in Jesus. And that you and I have this hope. That you and I can cling to this promise. With Jesus inside of us, man, we, are, we have an anchor that is steadfast and strong and gives us hope. Because I, as I said early on, you are holding on to one of two things in your life that you're being guided by. Number one, some of you are being guided by your feelings. And, and thus, that's why we make bad decisions when, when bad things happen to us, right? Like, I, I share this. When something bad happens to me, I, do, I can tend to do a really great job of making things worse. I'm, I've, for 33 years, I've been, I've been perfecting my skill at making things worse. I'm, I get better every year. If something happens to me, I, I tend to dig holes and I make things worse. Because I try and figure it out on my own. I try and solve it on my own. And I operate off my feelings, my thoughts, my wisdom, what I think I should do. Or number two, you can cling to the promises of God, which offers wisdom, hope, guidance, peace in the midst of any storm. What is your anchor this morning? Are you holding fast to the promises of God? In your marriage? In the way you treat your children? In the way you process the stresses of life? In the way you handle conflict? What are you holding fast to? Your feelings? Or the promises of God? And you and I can cling to those promises because of the character of God. God cannot lie. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Christian, hold fast to it. When you read the word of God, it is God's promises to you. And we can hold on to them. Let us pray together, shall we? 
with heads bowed and eyes closed this morning.